Great. Okay, um, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to our IC checkpoints for glaucoma diagnosis in a busy OPD. Today, ophthalmologists are seeing more and more patients, and as a, as a result, they're often quite pressed for time. In this situation, there is a tendency to miss the diagnose, diagnosis of glaucoma, which may be lurking. Now, this is an unfortunate situation because at present, there is no screening programs for glaucoma. The onus of diagnosing glaucoma rests within each and every individual uh, ophthalmologist, irrespective of his speciality, irrespective of where and how he practices. So this IC is going to offer certain uh, key points by which you can identify glaucoma. It's going to give you a checklist of uh, key uh, clinical findings by which uh, you can detect any coexisting glaucoma and you can make uh, a glaucoma evaluation a part of your uh, comprehensive eye examination. Now we have uh, a group of very uh, experienced uh, glaucoma experts in my uh, panel today. And um, before they come, I will start. I will be starting, I will be talking about the clinical red flags that you may find during your examination, which will help you uh, identify the presence of glaucoma. Now, glaucoma is not an uncommon disease. In fact, one fifth of the global burden of glaucoma is within India. Studies have shown that one in eight people above the age of 40 is either suffering from glaucoma or is at a risk of the disease. Now, screening for glaucoma is not feasible, as I've said before. So opportunistic screening of persons over 40 years who are, attend the IOPD is recommended. Now, certain types of glaucoma present with obvious uh, signs and symptoms. So when you have an acute form of primary angle closure glaucoma, or you have some of the secondary glaucomas, they have obvious uh, presenting features and the diagnosis is quite um, obvious. However, most types of glaucomas are silent. This includes the open angle uh, glaucoma, most forms of primary angle closure glaucoma, and the common types of secondary glaucoma, such as the pseudo exfoliative glaucomas and the steroid glaucomas. I will be focusing on this group of glaucomas mostly. Now, population based studies and um, uh, clinical trials have identified certain individuals who are at a greater risk of developing glaucoma. Of these, patients who are over 40 years of age and those individuals who have been have found to have an intraocular pressure greater than 21 millimeters of mercury, these are the two groups of patients who are at a greater risk. Other risk factors are family history of uh, glaucoma, those patients who have used steroids, pseudo exfoliation, the presence of myopia or shallow AC, these are very significant risk factors. And another risk factor is, of course, diabetes mellitus. A host of risk factors uh, have been found, uh, but their association is not as strong as the ones I have just mentioned. A comprehensive uh, patient history will then I help us identify which one of these uh, patients are at a greater risk of developing glaucoma. When we see an older patient, we have a tendency to think, well, this patient may have cataract, but this may, patient may also have glaucoma. There is a significant risk of open angle glaucoma after the age of 60 years, and the risk increases with each subsequent decade of life. Family members who have suffered from glaucoma also, uh, also have, uh, have uh, the first degree relatives of glaucoma patients also have a greater risk of developing glaucoma. We always take a uh, complete a medical history. It is our norm. In a busy OPD, it may not always be possible. But if you have to ask for one drug, then ask for the use of steroids. Elevation of intraocular pressure is seen in 18 to 30%, 36% of the population, irrespective of which um, 
whichever route of administration. And this is even more important now when the use of steroid has increased in the pandemic for treating the complications of uh, COVID. A medical history is very significant. In the past, there was some confusion whether diabetes are at a greater risk of, or, or not, but um, uh, uh, recent um, meta-analysis have shown that diabetes mellitus is a significant risk factor. If a patient has arthritis, he might have used steroids, or he might be at a uh, he might have uh, uveitis, which also be, which can be associated with secondary glaucoma. And always we must ask whether the patient has had an uh, eye injury or an eye operation in the past, because these patients are at a greater risk of developing secondary glaucomas. The refractive status is also very important. Myops have shown to have a two to five times higher prevalence of primary open angle glaucoma. The association is greater for greater higher degrees of myopia, but is present for myopia as lower as minus one diopter. Hyperopes or per se are not as, uh, has not been as identified as a risk factor. But hyperopic eyes do have shallow anterior chamber, and shallow anterior chamber has been identified as a risk factor for primary angle closure glaucoma. Now, coming to the slit lab examination, this is important for two reasons. One is to detect the signs of angle closure glaucoma, and the second is to detect the presence of any secondary glaucoma. Now, when, the, when it's an acute attack of angle closure, the, the signs and symptoms are often quite obvious. But a chronic angle closure disease often has very subtle features, but usually most of them will have a shallow anterior chamber. So we must try to detect a shallow anterior chamber. When we are using the torch to examine, to examine the pupils, we can also look for the uh, anterior chamber depth by the pen torch method, which is perhaps not the best method, but it is not a totally useless. At the slit lamp, the Van Herrick's test is also quite uh, useful. It has a sensitivity of 61.9% and a specificity of 89.3%. It is not, however, a replacement for gonioscopy. In 1996, Dr. Thomas and co-workers remarked, ideally, every patient attending an ophthalmology clinic should undergo a gonioscopic evaluation. In a busy outpatient clinic, this ideal is impractical. So Van Herrick's test is a quick method of estimating the depth of the anterior chamber. Now it utilizes a slit lamp beam to compare the thickness of the cornea to the depth of the peripheral anterior chamber. Now we keep the, we all know how to do this. It's a very simple test. We keep the observation uh, uh, B column of the mic of the slit lamp in the central position. And we put the illumination system at 60 degrees. We make the illumination slit very narrow and we make it as bright as possible. And we shine the illumination beam onto the peripheral con cornea. We will get two slits. One is the, is the bright corneal um, slit, and then we will get an optically darker slit uh, between the cornea and the iris. And we uh, estimate the, uh, we compare the uh, thickness of the uh, anterior, peripheral anterior jet depth to that of the corneal slit. Van Herrick then graded the peripheral anterior chamber depth to uh, according to how the thickness was in relation to the corneal thickness. Now, if the peripheral anterior chamber depth is equal to the corneal thickness, if the peripheral anterior chamber depth is uh, between half to full one thickness, or if it is between one quarter to even full thickness of the cornea, then we don't have to worry. These are grades two, three, and four. But if the cornea is one quarter to even less, then we are worried and a gonioscopy is must to identify any angle and uh, narrow angles. 
Secondary glaucomas uh, constitute 22% of all glaucomas. So it's very important to do a slit lamp examination. And often we, are, we have clues which will indicate the uh, etiology of the glaucoma. Pseudo-exfoliative glaucoma, neovascular glaucoma, steroid-induced glaucoma, inflammatory glaucoma. These are the commoner, commoner forms of glaucoma. And uh, a quick examination, um, looking at the pupil, looking at the conjunctiva, cornea, the iris, and the lens in a systematic manner will always identify the presence of the secondary glaucoma. It is important to do this slit lamp both in the dilated and in the undilated condition, especially because certain features may, may become very much more obvious. In a pseudo-exfoliative glaucoma, if you dilate it, you will see the classical bullseye pattern of uh, fibrillar deposits on the anterior capsule. And this might not be so obvious if it's not dilated. High intraocular pressure is a significant risk factor for all glaucomas and is the only modifiable one. It is so important uh, to do a proper application tonometry. 21 millimeters often cited as the upper border of normal. Dr. Manatik Singh will then now share his experiences on uh, intraocular pressure after this talk. Gonioscopy is the current gold standard for evaluating primary angle closure to disease. In India, the incidence of primary angle closure is as high and form half of all other primary glaucomas. Uh, Gonioscopy is also important for detecting many other diseases such as pseudo-exfoliative glaucoma. The disc and the retinal nerve fiber evaluation forms a cornerstone of the examination. Dr. Pal will be speaking on this subsequently. So here is my checklist, which, if, which you can do to, uh, in part of all of your comprehensive examinations so that you don't miss out. When you see a patient, if he is over 60, if he has diabetes, if he has, if he has myopia, be aware that these patients are at risk for glaucoma. Make it a point of asking every patient whether he has a family history of glaucoma, whether he has used steroid or is suffering from any diseases which may use, in which he may be using steroids, or whether he has an injury or a prior eye operation. Please check for the presence of delicate apparent fee period effect. Please check for uh, the anterior chamber depth. Please uh, check for pseudoexfoliation and rubiosis. Make intraocular examination, gonioscopy, and disc evaluation an integral part of all of your eye uh, examination and confirm by visual fiend analysis and imaging of the disc and retina. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Sukanya Mitra. Uh, may I call upon the panelists to invite the next speaker? I will ask Dr. Manadeep Singh, who is uh, to come um, to come and give his talk on application to Dr. So, Singh, have you uh, shared? I have to share because I think you have to unshare first. Okay. I'm not getting the sorry, option I'm to so share. Sorry. Uh, please let me introduce Dr. Singh. He's okay. a professor and head of department of ophthalmology of ABVIMS and Dr. RML Hospital. He's also the Joint Secretary of the Glaucoma Society of India. Dr. Singh, please keep Yeah, it. Yeah, can you see my slides? Yes, yes, sir, we can. So, uh, thank you so much, Dr. Sukanya, and thank you for uh, having faith in me to be able to deliver uh, with uh, along with so many other stalwarts, and uh, I'm extremely grateful to you and to AIUS as well. So no financial interest, of course, and uh, uh, as all of you know, that pressure sensitive neuropathy is uh, this uh, what disease we are talking and that is glaucoma and IOP is the only modifiable risk factors with a huge range of uh, huge range of normal pressure and uh, there can be the two factors are very important. Uh, the two factors are very important, the precision and the accuracy. And it's important to understand the difference. The precision is the observer factors that uh, inter and intra-observer variations, whereas accuracy is a variation 
of uh, IOP measured IOP from the true intraocular uh, IOP, intraocular IOP, which is measured by manometry and that one which is measured by tonometry. And uh, all of you, most of you uh, by now know that uh, central cornea thickness has got uh, effect on all these types of tonometry and so are the effects on corneal curvature and corneal biomechanics. There are few other considerations like corneal edema, refractive surgery, tonometry in children and there are many more factors which affect the intraocular pressure or intraocular pressure measurement which include diurnal variation, posture, season, use of necktie and so on and so forth. We will not go into details of this indentation toniometry, uh, but we will go into all the applination varieties. We will touch these tonometers and then we will go to Goldman application tonometer. And uh, this is a tono pen, which is a portable instrument. So the biggest advantage is it is useful in diseased corneas and with bandage contact lenses. However, it is not recommended for glaucoma evaluation. Non contact tonometry is a routine uh, uh, screening tool and it reads abnormal readings in the abnormal range. So uh, for screening, it is fine because it does uh, give a good job within the normal range. And pachymetry, of course, is must. The cardiac cycle is very important because it takes a measurement in one to three milliseconds. So the cardiac cycle can affect the reading significantly. This is a picture of dynamic contour uh, 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 tonometer and uh, which has a different, little different technology and is useful for after keratorefractive surgery. So it gives better readings, a more accurate reading in thin corneas. However, one should remember that it does not give accurate readings in thick corneas where GAT still stays better than this. Ocular response analyzer addresses some biomechanical properties and the rebound tonometer does not require anesthesia, so more useful in children. However, it does overestimate and uh, more so in thick corneas. So now we'll go to the details of uh, Goldman Appalachian Tonometer, which is a subject very close to my heart. So there are many factors which affect the IOP measurement by this tool. Uh, there are inter and intra observer variations. Adequacy of tear film is required. Width of the mires have to be considered. Central corneal thickness, corneal curvature, and biomechanical properties I have already told. So all these pictures, I think, uh, most of us are aware that this is what application tonometer is mounted on slit lamp. And uh, this is, uh, uh, these are the five parts, main parts of the application tonometer, which is attached to the uh, slit lamp. So this is about the calibration. It is generally done at zero, two and six points. This is done before the, we start the application tonometry. So I have put it at the first slide. And uh, uh, for this particular instrument, uh, calibration should be done three to six months, depending on the age of the instrument. And the acceptable variation for the position zero, position zero and two is one millimeters of mercury, whereas in position six, we accept an error of two millimeters of mercury. However, in rest of the other application tonometers also, this is the important calibration. Most are self-calibrated, uh, but if they go out of order, then uh, calibration goes wrong, then they generally are sent to the uh, factory workshop for this. And among the factors, the most important factor is the precise setting of the mark as shown in this uh, picture. About now the factors which affect uh, measurement, the corneal thickness, all tonometers are affected. Extent may vary, even DCT is affected. And high CCT records falsely high intraocular pressure. There are no nomograms, but the Morte Torpe, we can say that 14 micron uh, thickness affects one millimeters of mercury, and the standard thickness is 540 micron of the cornea. The corneal elasticity is very important, and it may be may show a very important factor. And this may replace central corneal thickness measures once its measurement becomes easier and financially visible for the doctors. And it is well known that as the age advances, not only the intraocular pressure rises, but also the Young's modulus, which is a measurement uh, of uh, the corneal elasticity also increase. So maybe this increase in the age, which we are calling as increase with the age may simply be a, a matter of uh, biomechanical properties rather than a, an increase with age. Corneal astigmatism becomes significant when it is more than three to four diopters. And 
this is because once this affinated area is elliptical, if there is astigmatism and it requires more pressure for affination, thereby resulting in error. To avoid this error, one needs to align the minus axis with the red mark on the prism or one has to take two readings, horizontal and vertical. As you can see, this red mark, uh, which is there at 43 degrees from zero is uh, there in all the patient tonometers. So now we'll see this uh, video of a short video of five minutes. The principle of affination introduced in 1954, GATT still remains a gold standard instrument to measure IOP for the management of glaucoma. The probe consists of a doubling by prism, which is used to affinate cornea and it optically splits the circular area of corneal contact into two horizontal semicircles by inducing horizontal shift. On touch, tear film appears as a bright yellow green spot, which turns into semicircular arcs when the tonometer is moved forwards. When 3.06 millimeter diameter of cornea is affinated, the semicircles interlock. The thickness of these semicircles represents tear meniscus on the sides of prism. Certain precautions need to be considered before undertaking the procedure. Remember to clean tonometer between two cases and disinfect the prism after a day's use. Remove the chemical completely after disinfection or cleaning. The equipment preparation includes setting the magnification at 10x, switching power to maximum illumination, maximum thickness and maximum height, bringing the blue filter in place and creating an angle of 60 degrees between illumination and microscope. Prism and tonometer should get fixed into notch. After this, turn the measuring drum to setting one, which is equivalent to 10 millimeters of mercury. Now, the patient preparation. After informing the patient about procedure, anesthetize both eyes with properacane. Place moistened fluorescein strip in lower conjunctival sac and place head of the patient on chin rest. Fluorescence of the stained tears facilitates visualization of tear meniscus at the margin of contact between cornea and the bioprism. At this point of time, I take an opportunity to share a few practical tips. Do not touch eyelashes with prism as they are not anesthetized and thus will induce blinking. It is more accurate to measure increasing than decreasing IOP. So, while starting measurement, keep drum position lower than expected value of IOP. Generally kept at 1, one may start with higher drum readings if IOP is expected to be very high. Now, I would brief the procedure for actual measurement. After obtaining contact, observe cornea through microscope. Regular pulsations of two exact semicircular rings or equal size show that tonometer is in correct position. These pulsations represent cardiac cycles. Drum is rotated to adjust pressure on globe until the internal edges of both semicircles meet at midpoint of these pulsations. Reading is multiplied by 10. Inaccurate vertical alignment can give rise to false high OP values. This part of video shows inaccurate vertical alignment which is being corrected. Inaccurate horizontal alignment means that IOP which is being recorded is different from actual intraocular pressure in the eye. Small semicircles away from each other suggest IOP is higher than shown by the drum position and large overlapping semicircles suggest drum reading is higher than actual intraocular pressure. When accurate IOP reading on drum is reached, the rings are exact semicircles of equal size, vertically well aligned and horizontally interlocked at internal edges. It is essential to emphasize that thickness of wires should be around one-tenth of the total diameter of flattened area. Thick wires, as shown here, lead to overestimation. Here, the prism tip as well as the eye should be wiped and pressure rechecked. Thin wires lead to underestimation of IOP and may need additional fluorescein. Prolonged contact of prism with cornea can lead to corneal injury and reduction of IOP and hence should be avoided. Although Goldman tonometer is gold standard due to its accuracy and reproducibility, it does have certain sources of error which may be patient, observer or The most important considerations are astigmatism and corneal thickness. Disinfection of prism 
is best done by foam bleach, sodium hypochlorite, 3% hydrogen peroxide, mild soap, or proprietary disinfectants recommended by the manufacturers. For cleaning in between cases, using hydrogen peroxide, dilute bleach, or simply distilled water are the most practical. One should make sure that prism tip is dried before use to avoid getting excessively broad mires. Now, the calibration check. Although the manufacturers recommend once a month calibration check of the instrument. Uh, I, I, I'll just forward it a little bit. 2 and 6. For position 2 and 6, marking of different side is required for different models. As shown here, if opposite marking is aligned, the calibration check cannot be performed. Precise setting of mark is key to successful calibration check. If any defect is detected in the calibration, the instrument may need to be sent to manufacturer for repair. So this is a correct alignment as we have already seen in the video. I'll not go into details. So the finally the check points. Uh, we should be aware of the sources of error and limitations of each device, whichever we are using for application tonometry. And Goldman application tonometry is the gold standard for intraocular pressure measurement. However, measurement of central cornea thickness with necessary estimation of corrected intraocular pressure forms a standard care. Even this gold standard equipment has sources of error which need to be addressed in individual cases, and so is the case with other tonometers. So, GAT is not uh, the best and also the GAT is not the best instrument for measurement of intraocular pressure in thin and regular corneas where we prefer to do different instruments. Thank you very much uh, for the opportunity. Thanks again. Thank you, Dr. Singh, for your very um, clear um, talk. And, and now we'll go on to our next speaker. Uh, I'll just stop sharing. Yes. Dr. Bhaduya, have you um, shared your screen? Not yet, because he has to stop sharing first. Uh, okay. I'm trying to stop sharing. Sir, stop sharing. I'm going to do it here. Okay, okay. Dr. Okay, okay, okay. will be okay. talking up on gonioscopy. She is the director of the Regional Institute of Ophthalmology in Sitapur and has been practicing glaucoma for many years. Somehow it's showing Zoom and it's not permitting access. System preferences is saying open. Can you see my screen? Yeah, we can see you, but not just me. Have you gone to share screen at the bottom? Yeah, I've gone to share screen. It's showing Zoom US. And uh, just a moment. Then we will open first PPD. Oh, PPD is open. Share screen, KJ, man. I've done it. Zoom. Pe. Uh -huh. She's already presented other other places. So, uh -huh. but this is a different laptop. Actually, that is a challenge, Chandrima. I think what I'll do is go ahead with the next presenter. I'll shift the laptop, and I'll come back to you. Just a moment. I'm not able to see the system preferences here. Actually, can anybody guide me? Now, up Zoom. Pe, Zoom. Pe, up. Pe, zoom. Pe, share, zoom. Pe share, share. Are, main, mujhe pata hai. Is mein kuch Apple ke problem kar raha hai. It is telling me allow Apple to share the, to the Zoom. I am making it uh, this thing, but it's not working with that. Then go to the Zoom app and open it there. It's open the Zoom there app is, only. There is some setting, ma'am, that is uh, not enabled. Uh, yeah. So I think let Chandrima go on. I'll I'll take it next. Sure, ma'am. Sure. In the meantime, I'll work on it. Right. Yes, ma'am. Okay. You. I'll log out for the moment. I'll come back later. Okay. Doctor Bal is uh, Doctor Bal uh, present? She had a um... yes. Yes, I'm here. I'm here. Okay, then can you share your screen? Yes, yes, yes. Dr. Chandima Pal will be talking on the disc evaluation, disc and retinal nerve fiber evaluation. And Dr. Pal is the director of the BBI Foundation in Bengal. She is the president of the Kolkata Association of uh, Ophthalmologists. She is the general secretary of the Glaucoma Society of India. Dr. Pal, very happy to have you here. Could you give your talk? Thank you, Dr. Shukona. Thank you very much for giving me this opportunity of being a part of your prestigious IC. So I shall take you through disk evaluation, the key signs to look for. The host has, okay. 
So high intraocular pressure is not primary open angle glaucoma. The OATH study showed us that without optic disc assessment, you may be missing up to 55% of glaucoma patients. And disc change precedes visual field loss in most cases. Overestimation of glaucoma may happen with large size discs, congenital anomalies like coloboma and hyperplasia, and peripapillary atrophy. So any deviation from the customary needs a follow-up. So optic disc changes in glaucoma, you can see a host of points which I have out here, starting from loss of the ISM pattern to localize notch in the rim, acquired bit disc hemorrhage, wedge diffuse, loss of RNFL layer, absent rim inferiorly, and so on and so forth. So this is how we used to document the disc, say about 20 years back, when we didn't have stereoscopic photography. We would look at the disc at the slit lamp with a high lens, and then we would actually draw it. But today we have the stereoscopic photography, which gives you a much better definition of the disc. So the five hours for assessment of optic disc in glaucoma, observe the scleral ring to identify the limits of the optic disc and the size, identify the size of the rim, examine the retinal nerve fiber layer, examine the region of parapapillary atrophy and look for retinal and optic disc hemorrhages. So the optic disc size is of paramount importance for us to evaluate the optic disc. So you first have to define the scleral ring. Once you define the scleral ring, you have to look for the vertical disc diameter and the horizontal disc diameter. So measurement of optic disc size with biomicroscopy, as I told you, you use a high plus lens and then apply the manufacturer's uh, constant to it. And that's how you get the size. So about average vertical disc diameter is about 1.8 millimeters and average horizontal diameter is about 1.7 millimeters. So size of the cup varies with size of the disc. Large discs have large cups and those could be healthy eyes. That's an average disc with 1.9. That's a small disc with 1.4 and that's a large disc with 2.4. So identify small discs and large optic discs. Small discs, average vertical diameter is less than 1.5 millimeter and large discs, average vertical diameter is more than 2.2 millimeters. So you could very often find a large disc which you've labeled as glaucomatous and a small disc which we've labeled as non-glaucomatous. So intrapapillary equivalent of the RNFL. So don't confound it with Welshnick's parapapillary scleral ring. So I'm just coming to it in a moment. What we're interested out here is the neuroretinal rim. I always compare it with the donut. We're not interested in the hole. We're interested in the chocolate on the rim. So this is the area which you need to look very carefully, the configuration and the pallor. So neuroretinal rim, what applies is the isn't rule. Isn't rule is nothing, but the largest diameter is of the inferior part of the disc, followed by the superior, then nasal, and then inferior. And any deviation from that actually needs a follow-up. So the neuroretinal rim, the shape, size, and pallor, and then whether the isn't rule is absent or present. So parapapillary atrophy. Parapapillary atrophy, again, what we're interested in is the beta zone. This is the zone we're interested in. We are not bothered about the alpha zone. So if there is a beta zone, that's pathognomonic of glaucoma. So optic disc hemorrhages, detection of disc hemorrhages requires careful optic disc examination. As you see in these pictures, the optic disc hemorrhages that are there and uh, localized thinning or notch is also a pathognomonic feature. There's a notch out there inferiorly and that's pathognomonic. About the RNFL, look for silver striations to define the RNFL. You have it diffuse and localized RNFLs and it also can be graded in normal, mild, moderate, and severe. So to delineate a disc with a cup disc ratio, this is how we assess it. So you put this hole as a one, calculate this distance, the inferior rim. So in this case is 0 0.20 and the superior rim in this case is 0.15. So if you minus, uh, add these two, 0.25 plus 0.15, and minus it from one, you get a disc of 0 0.65. So cup disc in discs with normal configuration, I just told you that they are generally uh, vertically oval, and localized nerve fiber notching or 
focal extension, acquired bit of the optic nerve, diffuse rim loss. You've got to distinguish it from all these features. Asymmetry of the cup is another uh, sign which you have to look for, but also be careful of the differential diagnosis like hyperplasia, morning glory syndrome, coloboma, and congenital pit. So asymmetry of the cup size, generally more than 0.2, is common in the glaucomatous population and entertain strong suspicion if you do see that. So nasalization of the vessels, that is also another sign that you need to when you're doing disc evaluation. And areas where there is thin or absent uh, 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 the neuroretinal rim that needs to be looked for. This is a picture I got from the forum where you can actually view in conjunction together the visual fields, the OCT and the optic discs. And actually you can correlate all three and come to your diagnosis is rather useful in clinical practice. And this is uh, the Heidelberg. I particularly got this picture because the Heidelberg actually gives you a very good uh, measurement of the RNFL since it co uh, covers the RNFL change due to age. So you can actually see whether it's due to age, the RNFL thinning, or actually it's due to glaucoma. And of course it does have these quadrant values, which it gives. So there's the macular ganglion cell mapping as well, the GCC, the ganglion cell complex, which can be uh, recorded. So the errors that we commonly make are uh, that underestimate glaucoma, not delineating the scleral ring correctly, ignoring the small size of the disc, missing a rim notch, missing a hemorrhage, missing a RNFL defect. This is an example. That's the disc that I saw. And nine years later, this is what I saw. So if you look at that, this again is actually from the uh, octopus perimeter. And I got this for you because I thought it's a wonderful correlation of structure and function where you have the structure and the function together. These lines that you show uh, see are of progression. So if you compare this, this with this 1998 with 2007, look at the progression that can be detected out here in the cluster uh, analysis of the octopus. This is another patient seven years later. And uh, that's the uh, thinning of the retinal nerve fiber layer. And there's a large progression out there. So the octopus is detected in here. The green lines that you see are the areas which have improved and the red lines are the ones where it's deteriorated. So you can actually detect both structure and function deterioration progression on the octopus uh, polar trend analysis. So in summary, glaucoma is largely undiagnosed, about 90%. Misdiagnosis is common, about 50%. Pay attention to individuals at high risk. Adopt good clinical practices. Optic nerve head evaluation is the key skill, and it's a must learn. Be aware of the pitfalls in diagnosis. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Pal. That was an excellent talk on the disc evaluation. Uh, Dr. Bhaduria, are you ready to give yeah, your yeah. talk? Yep, yep, I'm ready. Okay. Dr. Bhaduria will talk on gonioscopy. Yep, so uh, just a moment, let me get to full screen. Right, so uh, as we have seen in uh, most of our lives, gonioscopy is the most neglected uh, test in the OPD. And unfortunately, the entire glaucoma management is fully dependent on gonioscopy because uh, treatment protocols for POAG and PACG and secondary glaucomas are all different. Uh, so they cannot be one on another one. And uh, India is an angle of uh, country of angle closure, as, uh, as uh, Sukanya said earlier only. Unfortunately, this anterior chamber is visible, but angle of anterior chamber is not visible because on the straight lab examination. So therefore, we need to incorporate gonioscopy so that it can be done easily and it can be a part of the comprehensive examination. But what is actually coming in the way? The biggest hurdle in all the mind is the mindset. People feel it's time consuming, it's cumbersome and it's not really essential. Second thing is such good drugs are available, surgeries are available. I'll prescribe drugs, why do I do a gonioscopy and waste my time? Another thing is difficulty in the technique and the equipment. Many people haven't really learned the technique well during residency. And that is one of the reasons this comes away. And another thing is that in residency, when we teach the technique, we teach so many classifications that a student is so thoroughly confused about the classifications that when they move out, they feel it's something difficult, it's something challenging, complicated, so let's get done with it. 
but the mindset the most important factor in the entire thing is a mindset so the moment a person understands the value of gonioscopy it it becomes automatic automatically incorporated all the hurdles are this thing the fear of failure of interpretation is another thing which really is comes in the way of multiple people who are very uncomfortable about doing gonioscopy so how it comes is really is that why should we do it first and foremost classify glaucomas if there is angle closure how much is it there will it occlude on dilatation or will there be abnormal structures which are going to be troublesome in the end which we cannot see and finally will it progress so uh, in history we, we if we are not able to do it everybody let's see in history if their patients are above 40 years of age young adults with history of glaucoma their trauma steroids use family history of glaucoma epi for if any of these things are their children with large eyes gonioscopy becomes mandatory then if when we do a straight lamp examination if angle is come appears narrow actually all this sukanya has already told so i won't be wasting time on it but if you see signs of acute angle closure glaucoma or you see on the pupillary border pseudox foliation no vascularization and uh, tears is, is mandatory again then if there is a raised iop in any of the secondary glaucomas then coming to lenses that we use the capes lens is only for the value of it now we use a four mirror under the set lamp it works perfectly well so the mirror uh, the lens that we generally use is a four mirror we can use two mirror also two mirror actually needs the coupling medium and then with four mirror what we can do good is indentation gonioscopy that will tell us the state of angle in angle closure and also how much is the synecule and how much is non synecule will pi work or not work on it so advantages are many but disadvantages is difficult to learn to start with and is it to put more force therefore we can get a false open angle so interpretation i'll have simplified to the core if you see no structure grade 0 if you see one structure grade 1 two structures grade 2 three structures grade 3 and the structures we do end to end from solvays line to trabecular mesh work to scale spur or ciliary body band now starting people feel making a corneal wedge is difficult so let's stop the corneal wedge let's start from the pupillary border let's go the reverse way so we look at the pupillary border for all the signs blood vessels etc etc and uh, then we go slightly more careful and look at the contour of the iris this is very important because normal people will have slightly concave iris but people who are myopes or who are pigmentary glaucoma they will have concave but the real fear lies is what it is when the iris is more concave these are the people who are likely to go into angle closure glaucomas so uh, peripheral iris now where is it inserting the peripheral iris is inserting actually at the normally is inserting at the ciliary body band or sclerosis spur but it could be even anterior and if it's more anterior it's usually these glaucomas are the congenital glaucomas or joegs come to ciliary body band if you see ciliary body band in any gonioscopy be sure this angle is not likely to close you are good then if we say sclerosis spur also we are very sure that this angle will not close now anything behind that would be a ciliary body band cytodialysis cleft or idodialysis this thing the uveo scleral flow is behind the scleral spur and tm flow is ahead of it so it's a very important landmark and this this white line is very very important for all of us to keep in mind that this is essential to identify then comes this beautiful trabecular mesh work could be pigmented or non pigmented actually there's a lot of debate on being pigmented non pigmented but the bottom line here stays is that 0 to 1 is fine 0 to 1 even up to 2 is fine but 3 is there then think of diabetes think of sudox foliation if it's grade 4 there is no other diagnosis but pigment dispersion syndrome or pigmentary glaucoma iris processes now these we can see very fine fine strand going into the trabecular mesh work they don't cross the trabecular mesh work and these are very often in congenital glaucomas and also in juvenile glaucomas so now the angle depth is most deep in the inferior and least deep in superior and in normal people the difference is not more than one angle structure coming to interpretation of angles if ciliary body band is seen angle is open if only anterior tm is seen then we are in doubt we must see posterior tm at least 180 degrees only then we will call it the angle is 
excludable or not. Again, I will reiterate 120, 180 degree posterior TM is not seen. That means we are dealing with something which is not a, uh, which is not a, uh, which is a, a fluidable angle. Plativirus very important thing. We you must see a double hump sign over here. If you see this double hump, it is plativirus. Now, why why is it important for us to see that? Because if you look at it here, the actual angle is only this much, but visible is this much. So therefore, when you do a gonioscopy, you will find this angle will easily dilate when you do a uh, dilatation. These are the people who will end up into acute angle closures also. So this is an angle before PI and after PI. Again, after PI, when we do the gonioscopy, we really get to see that uh, how much is sinic here and how much is appositional. And will we need drugs or will we need surgery for this patient? Then coming to iris cyst, these bumps look like lumps in the anterior chamber angle. They don't really bother you unless until there are too many of them. So this, this, this pigment is the hallmark of Krukenberg spindle. And then if you look at this angle, it is so black that you can barely differentiate. And this is the so classical Zaplowski line. If you see this ring, this is pseudo exfoliation. And if you look at the iris here, this is uh, uh, defects. And here you will see certain amount of extra pigmentation and pseudo exfoliation material is sitting here in the angle. In NVG, Pupils dilate sometimes so much that you can see actually ciliary processes over here. These are the anterior synecias of ICE or axial field triggers. If, I, if unilateral, then it's usually ice, otherwise it's axial field. This is late onset juvenile glaucoma. Look at these beautiful ciliary processes and the not so well formed angle. This is angle recession. This is the broadening of ciliary body band. This is cyclodialysis and this is hydrodialysis. This is, this is a heptic, which is sitting here in the angle. And this is a trabeculectomy, which has been closed by the, uh, what do we call it, uh, uh, iris. This is a case of neurofibromatosis. You will see the angle is not properly formed. And this is a Sturge Weber syndrome, in which if you see here, there's so many vessels and angle is again not properly formed. So how do, often do we do it? At first diagnosis in all suspects, in all the patients, pre-PI and post-PI, every six months in a stable angle closure, and whenever the fluctuation is there or the control is poor, every two years in patients of POAG. Now let's come down to checkpoints. It is part of the normal examination and it is not something very specific. So first thing is that we have to get the fear out of it. We have to start thinking that we can actually do it and we can interpret well. Try us with two, two uh, mirrors first, then four mirrors. Must indent if there is an angle closure. If there is an angle closure, it's a must see whether it is synecal or appositional. If synecal, how much? And will this patient at any stage require PI or further surgery? Other than that, we look for so many other things like neovascularization. We can look at the haptic in the angle. We can see closed trabecular activity. We can see signs of trauma. So there's so many things to be seen. So we should be seeing all these things is what I would want to say. With that, thank you so much. I think I wasted time, so I finished in time. Can there be any questions I can take from you now? Sorry, Thank you, Dr. Madhu. That was an excellent talk and an excellent uh, presentation. Uh, we will take the questions later because uh, we won't know how we are for time. So uh, sure. I would. I need to log off because I have another session in another hall. Okay, Thanks. then. Um... Thanks. Thank you so much. Bye. Nice meeting you. Okay, then. All right. Bye bye. bye. Um, our next speaker is Dr. Amit. Uh, Dr. Amit, are you ready with your presentation? Thank you, Dr. Amit is, uh, is the head of the glaucoma service at Joitram Netrala Indore, and he is a member of the scientific of the All India Ophthalmological Society. Dr. Amit, please give your talk on the OCT and the visual field. I'm not getting the whole zoom, but can you just guide me? The zoom. We are zoom able to see your. But I am not able to, yeah. Now, I, my screen is visible, the whole PowerPoint? Yes. Yeah. 
So I'm going to talk on the next step, perimetry and OCT, a quick guide to interpretation. We all know that automated perimetry is a gold standard in glaucoma diagnosis and management. So when a perimetric test is needed, what we do advise? We advise a 24-2 size 3 white CETA standard threshold. This is usually the best choice of uh, perimetry, which is to be advised. So coming to the interpretation, to interpret the visual field systematically, the printout is divided into seven sections or seven uh, yeah, zones. So basically, this is the way we divide uh, we divide our uh, printout. So I'm going to talk about each of these zones separately so that uh, we can discuss how to uh, what are these zones. So coming to zone one, basically, it is a demographic and testing condition. Uh, this is the document in which patient documents the patient's data. That is a name, ID, date of birth, age, date and time of testing, visual acuity, pupil size, and the eye test state. It also shows the strategy, fixation target, and the refractive uh, correction. So this is this part of the printout of the Humphreys field. We'll show you this. I'm basically a Humphreys user, so I'm going to talk only about how to read a normal Humphreys printout. So coming to the zone two is reliability criteria. Basically, what are these reliability criteria? You have the fixation losses, which is a gaze stability. It should be less than 20%. You have the false positive, which should be less than 50%. If it is more, that means it's a trigger happy patient. Then you have the false negative. What is this false negative? It assesses the patient's inattention or advanced disease. And when the fields are not being performed properly, it shows an unacceptable errors, which are marked by two crosses. And it also shows the four wheel threshold, which should be more than 30 decibels. So this is uh, gaze tracking. Basically, you can see it measures the gaze direction every time a stimulus is present. It is present at the bottom of the single field analysis printout. The line extending upward it, it amounts to the gaze of a gaze error during stimulus presentation. And the line extending downwards is basically the instrument is unsuccessful within the gaze direction that is the thing. Coming to the zone three is the gray scale. Uh, gray scale, it is basically the threshold numeric values which are expressed in gray format. The dark areas indicate reduced sensitivity and it is important depicting the artificial loss and profound visual field defects. Zone four is a total deviation plot. Now, what is this total deviation plot? It has a numerical plot and a probability plot. It is point by point difference of the patient's threshold from the expected, from that expected, from those expected in age corrected normals. So it shows the overall sinking of the hill of the vision and is usually caused by media opacities like cataract cornea or refractive or meiosis. The probability plot predicts the chances of such a normality occurring in the normal population and it is shown there also. And the scale is provided for ease of interpretation. Coming to the pattern deviation plot, which is the zone five, the machine adjusts for the overall depression of the visual field due to cataract or some other reason and it highlights the localized photomas that have been hidden inside this depressed visual field. The numerical plot and probability plot is shown in this pattern deviation plot also. And in the probability plot, try to look for the abnormal points in clusters. Probability plot is the single most useful analysis when glaucoma is suspected. Coming to zone six is basically the global indices. It shows the statistical manipulation of total and pattern deviation plot. All the plots are reduced to a single value that provides us uniform information about our patient's visual field. There are three such global indices. You have the visual field index, the mean deviation, and the pattern standard, pattern standard deviation. So what is this visual field index? It is called as VFI. It represents the entire visual field as a single percentage of normal. So it is more sensitive to changes in the center of the field. It provides improved correspondence to the ganglion cell loss. It is less affected by cataract. So 100% means it is a normal function. 0% means it is a perimetric blindness. Coming to the mean deviation, basically it is weighted average of the values presented in the total deviation plot. It indicates the overall depression or elevation of the patient's hill of vision. Positive number indicates elevation and negative number indicates a depression. A negative number is likely to be found on cases of media opacity such as cataract, corneal opacity, refractive error, or meiosis. Coming to pattern standard deviation, it highlights any irregularity in the visual field or scotomas that may be hidden in a depressed hill of vision. You can see in this picture, it is low for normal fields, for uniformly depressed fields, and for blind fields. It is highest in moderate to advanced local, localized loss. Now, VFI and MD, that is the visual field index and the mean deviation, will help us in staging and following the patients. The levels of statistical significance compared to normal are shown next to the mean deviation, the PSG values that fall outside the normal range. So if the value is given without any P value, that it is considered as normal. Zone 7, coming to the glaucoma hemifield test, basically it's a visual sensitivity is measured in five zones, which are located as mirror images in the superior and the inferior quadrants of the visual field. And how do we interpret this? The interpretation of the glaucoma hemifield is interpreted as outside the normal limits. That is, at least one zone pair differs by an amount found in fewer than 1% of the normal population. Borderline, which means at least one zone pair differs by an amount found in fewer than 3%, but less than, but more than 1%. Abnormal high sensitivity, 
the best test point location is elevated to an extent expected in less than 0.5% of the population and abnormal low sensitivity which means the best test point location is depressed to an extent expected in less than 0.5% of the population then you have within the normal limits that is none of the above conditions are met so there are the five interpretations of the glaucoma immunity field test outside normal limit borderline abnormal high sensitivity abnormal low sensitivity and within normal limits coming to zone 8 that is the actual threshold values are shown in this it is a raw data it is inserted for any pattern or scotoma so by concentrating on the actual threshold values one may pick up a suggestion of a scotoma scotoma is not compared to the normal but it is compared to the surrounding area so this graph doesn't compare to the normal now we have something called as anderson and petrelius criteria which are very important so what are these criteria any one of these should be present in the single field printout that is an abnormal glaucoma immune field test a pattern standard deviation abnormal at p less than 5% level you should have a cluster of three or more points on the pattern deviation plot abnormal at p less than 5% level and at least one at p less than 1% level in an expected area of visual field so how to read the checkpoints so basically as i told you to read uh, we learn these mnemonics called as grades so g that is the general information r is the reliability a look for the abnormal or the normal fields d look for the defects e evaluate and s is subsequent evaluation so the re reading of a normal humphrey script can be made very easily if you divide the whole print out into this following zones now coming to the next talk part of my talk was oct a quick guide to interpretation now oct is accepted as adjunct tool in assessing and monitoring glaucoma currently the most common commercially available sd oct is a serous rt view spectralis and topcon each machine has different glaucoma scan patterns proprietary software segmentation algorithm and display output so this is very very important one has to understand this the data of one machine can't be compared with that of another machine so this is very very important when you are reading an oct report if the patient gets a oct report from a serous machine and you have an rt view you are going an rtv report you can't compare these two reports so coming to the sd oct what are these clinical applications for glaucoma we have the nerve fiber layer analysis the optic nerve analysis the ganglion cell analysis the guided progression analysis anti segment imaging by oct with anti segment premier module and combination analysis from sd oct and the humphrey's visual field now how does uh, this analysis report uh, help us it offers a qualitative and a quantitative information in an easy to read format So basically, you have this RMF and optic nerve head, optic disc cube, which is 200 by 200 size. This scan of the optic disc captures a 6 by 6 millimeter cube. So the area within this is segmented for analysis, and from this cube of data, the machine automatically identifies the center of the disc and creates a 3.46 millimeter calculation circle around the disc. And the RMF thickness along this periphery area is analyzed and compared to the normative data. So as we divided the Humphreys field into various zones. even an onh and nf analysis report this is the report how it uh, how we get it after the print out is taken it has to be divided into various zones so zone 1 is basically the patient data zone 2 you can see uh, zone 2 is basically the key parameters compared to the normative data which are displayed in table format zone 3 is the nerve fiber layer thickness map which is a topographical display of rnfl and r glass shape of yellow and red color is typical of normal eyes zone 4 is the rnfl deviation map which shows how much is the deviation from the normal Zone five is the neuroretinal thickness profile, which is matched to the normative database, and zone six is the RNF TSNIT graph, which displays the patient's RNF measurements along this calculation circle compared to the normative data. So this is the six zones which I showed. Coming to the next seven zones, basically you have the RNF uh, quadrant, clock uh, quadrant, and clock hour average thickness, which is again matched to the normative database. You have the horizontal and the vertical B scans. Which are extracted from the data cube to the center of the disc, and then you have the RNF calculation circle, which is automatically sent to the optic disc and extracted from the data cube. So coming to the zone one, which shows the patient's age, uh, da data, image quality, and signal strength, you have to stress on this and see whether the proper name has been entered, the date of birth has been entered, because both in Humphreys as well as in OCT, the proper age is very important because everything is compared to the normative database. coming to the key parameters there is a normative comparison is based on the patient's age and disc size for a particular age and disc size the patient is expected to have a rim volume cd ratio etc within certain ranges so those parameters will be shaded as red yellow and green based on how they compare to the normal ranges so when the disc area is outside the normal limits the normative data comparison is not there and when there is no normative data comparison the parameters are shown in y uh, in gray instead of green yellow and red as shown in this example So RNFL quadrant and clock hours, uh, that is zone seven. You can see 
uh, or the superior inferior the laser and temporal quadrant and the clock hours also and the inferior quadrant is the thickest uh, when we compare to the normative database so what does this color coding means to us basically it is an optional patient education page the ocd funders image with the deviation map facilitates the discussion with the patient about their pain loss the rnfl peripapillary thickness profile is shown for each eye providing easier visualization and comparison so the color coded indication of normative data comparison for rnfl is distribution of the normals so what does the white color means the thickest 5% of the measurements fall in the white area the green color means that the 90% of the measurements fall in, fall in the green area and the yellow color means that the thinnest 5% of the measurements fall in the yellow area or below and red means the thinnest 1% of the measurements fall in the red area so measurements in red are considered as outside normal limits so the onh values will be shaded gray if the disk area is not within the central 90% of the normal range so coming to the limitations uh, we do have some limitations with this oct that can be the acquisition dependent database related artifacts disease related variation and other co-founders co uh, uh, dr sukanya if i am running short of time please let me know because i am not able to see the timer here you still can have 4 minutes to go i still have 4 minutes carry on okay, please fine. carry on your okay. talk is very interesting thank you so we have this acquisition dependent artifact also now what is this acquisition dependent artifact we look for the signal strength the scan quality affects the ocd performance so if it's the effect is greater on rnfl than on onh and the ganglion cell complex so the best quality scan should have a signal strength of more than 8 but an acceptable is anything more than 6 so 5 or anything less than 5 is not acceptable you should repeat your scans so each machine has its own signal strength value so refer to your user manual so like zeiss shows in the increments of 1 to 10 whereas the uh, rt view will be showing in terms of 100 the top one will be showing in terms of 100 so every machine has its own proprietary algorithms as i mentioned in the beginning of my talk so do not compare signal strength of two different machine there can be technical errors due to this decentration i movement or the microseconds you can see in this graph that this horizontal line which i'm showing with my mouse is because of the movement of the eye again you can see this microseconds in this measurement queue and due to the blink you, you can see how it looks so these are the acquisition dependent artifact then you have the database dependent artifacts now again let me tell you this machines the normative data is not a huge normative data the normative data is limited to which everything is compared so you have a red disease and a green disease now red disease is a missed diagnosis that you have missed a diagnosis and green disease is you have missed a diagnosis so again it's a misnomer so color code det determined by the database of the instrument so what is red disease a diagnosis is a glaucoma based on mistaken identification of an area as abnormal so patient is not represented in the normative database that's why the rnfl thickness falls outside the normal range and the average rnfl value is shown as red now why because it is not there in the normative database so when this occurs especially in refractive wastings like especially high myopia now what is green disease it is a missed glaucoma diagnosis because the oct appears normal in this the average rnfl thickness shows green color so you feel that the oct is normal but actually it is not so if you look at the small focal changes of damage you can see in this the red free image that there is an rnfl defect here in the oct there is an rnfl defect but whereas in the mouse it is not showing any defect it is showing green color the average rnfl thickness but when you look at a particular area you can see that there is an rnfl thickness uh, the, the rnfl uh, loss in the clock hour segment so basically small focal areas of damage are there which are uh, not included in the average rnfl thickness it shows up as green because the instrument averages the thickness in a particular sector so the focal change is masked by global parameters you can see in this example in the right eye the average rnfl thickness was 87 but when you look at this uh, deviation map you can see there is an rnfl defect which has been reflected in the inferior quadrant and also in the inferior clock hours and also in the rnfl Uh, thickness map and also in the uh, uh, neuronal rim thickness map and the rnfl thickness map you can see this localized defect so never get biased by just looking at the average rnfl thickness you have to read the whole oct in total you can see and this defect is correlating with our red free photograph which have been shown here so again age of the patient is very important like for the size if the patient is less than 18 years of, of age all parameters are white you can see all these parameters there is no there is no significance of any color here there is no red white yellow green there is no red green or yellow color why because there is no age matched database now for the size machine anything uh, less than 18 years there is no age matched normative data so whatever patient suppose 15 or 16 years of age you subject them to oct this is how you are going to get everything is shown in white now coming to the disease related variation you have the floor effect now what is this floor effect 
we advance loss the rnfl thickness levels of rarely below 50 microns and almost never below 40 so due to the assumed presence of residual glial and non urinary tissue including the blood vessels you get this for at least 40 mm micron thickness as the rnfl but never less than that so at this level of disease you no know point in getting serial oct done what is more important is we should get visual fields done so do not use oct in advanced glaucoma you have to monitor through your visual fields now this is called floor effect other con uh, ocular confounders are media opacities so the areas in which the data is missing is due to an opacity which are represented as black in the nfas slo image you can see in this these are the vitreous opacities and they are basically uh, shown as black spots which are highlighted in my pictures next is segmentation errors it is important to look for proper placement of the segmentation line which are produced by the sd oct machine software algorithm these lines should not come together but they should be at infinity so this is how the segmentation line will look at different signal strength and uh, basically a diagnosis of glaucoma to summarize can't be just based only on oct or only on visual fields you have to examine the patient in total so the fundus photograph the retinal photograph the fields the oct and the ganglion cell complex which is a new thing everything has to be correlated so coming to the checkpoints just last two slides so the checkpoints for visual field always look for the test parameters whether they have been entered properly or not the birth date proper trial lens test program pattern selected look for the reliability indexes there is a high fixation loss false positive false negative the gray scale used for quick identification of potential scotomas and depressions the total deviation which is designed for generalized visual field defect the pattern deviation which is designed to highlight the localized defect two defects on the pd should be characterized by the shape and location look for the global indices differentiate from glaucomatous and neurological field and always look for the andersons and pretellas criteria Now, coming to the checkpoints for oct proper entry of patient's parameter is very important as we showed in the fields also appropriate centration of the peripapillary circular scan if your machine is not having the auto autofocus major uh, option signal strength value of a scan should be greater than 5 uh, as i told you before should be greater than 6 check for quality of the scan if possible do a gcc analysis for early detection of glaucoma and watch out for the red disease and the green disease thanks a lot for the precious time thank you dr amit that was a great talk you had a very long topic and you managed it beautifully i will be getting back to you i would like to start the discussion with dr manadeep um dr singh are you available yes sorry i i was muted uh, i'm available yes He, Dr. Singh, I would just like to ask you: In the pandemic, uh, what are your thoughts of using the non-contact tonometer? First of all, the accuracy, because in a busy OPD, it would be a benefit to a uh, um, ophthalmologist who has a lot, a lot of patients. And number two is: In the pandemic, is there any extra risk or benefit in using the NCT? see uh, last year during the first wave there was lot of discussion about uh, this topic that the aerosol generated can transmit the uh, infection but then slowly and slowly as the experience improved with the pandemic and we realized that it really does not matter and the risk with this is much less than transmitting the risk uh, through the contact methods uh, which because uh, even the tears uh, sometimes may have the virus so uh, even when we clean it uh, with uh, alcohol uh, uh, swabs we still are uh, i think less at risk than with the nct than with any other method of any other touch method of yes. tonometry so uh, i am now routinely using it every day and 100% of my patients above 35 and uh, most of my patients under 35 uh, they come they they undergo this because my room i have in my personal i am working in a government institution where there are large number of rooms and multiple consultants are there but uh, my room has a separate nct and my pn is trained he can he does it before sending every patient to me so we are using it for every patient practically and uh, as, as a screening, screening as a screening tool as mm -hmm. a screening tool whenever uh, the range its the pressure is around 20 or higher then uh, we do goldman affluence tonometry because in the normal range it gives normal but the slightest if a patient has a pressure of say 30 with affluence tonometry the nct will not give 32 it will generally give 40 45 so there is a huge diff if the pressure is high but within the normal range i think it's it's a perfect instrument for screening yes it's better than having nothing i mean not checking no 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 no, 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 no it's 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 a good instrument 
yes. to rule out the disease yes definitely. not to rule out the disease but to rule out the uh, ocular hypertension you can say ocular hypertension and then go, go forward with that yeah okay yeah. uh hey, dr madhu, madhu is not here dr chandima is, is she available yeah yeah i'm here i'm here Dr. Chandima, um, a large number of ophthalmologists still use the direct ophthalmoscope to uh, evaluate. Now, a glaucoma person would obviously be using uh, 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 this thing, non contact uh, uh, this thing, a lens, a 90 adapter or a 78 adapter lens. But uh, what do you feel about a direct ophthalmoscope? How uh, accurate is it to assess the disc? Well, again, coming to the same thing, like Dr. Manavdeep said, is that it's better to do something than not to do. Is like uh, with the direct, at least you can have a look at the disc. You cannot appreciate the stereopsis, but mm -hmm. then you can at least delineate um, non-glaucomatous from a glaucoma uh, patient. I think you might not be able to do a disc evaluation as such, but at least you can, you know, correlate uh, the glaucomatous disc with high pressures, if it's yes. pressure. nothing at all, yeah, you do it. But then in COVID times, again, it's very difficult to do a direct, uh, direct ophthalmoscopy. Yes. Then an indirect ophthalmoscopy, is that, uh, uh, would you say? Indirect suggest? ophthalmoscopy, yeah, is relatively better because uh, like our fellows now do mainly indirect ophthalmoscopy only. We've removed the direct ophthalmoscopes from the OPD mm -hmm. because of COVID. But with indirect ophthalmoscope, again, like you don't get a very good stereopsis of the disc. It's mainly mm -hmm. for the periphery and uh, stuff like that for retinal surgeons. But even then, you know, if there's nothing at all, you, you definitely need to have a look at the disc. You cannot it's diagnose glaucoma without yes. having a look at the disc. You know, yes. so. But uh, we're having such a, a lot of uh, resistance to gonioscopy that uh, I don't know how many people are going to actually pick up a 78 and a 98 and a 90 adapter before they do a gonioscopy. So, um, Dr. Amit, are you available? Yeah, I'm there. Dr. Supine, I'm there. Yes. Dr. Amit, uh, in a busy practice, uh, can an uh, ophthalmologist rely totally on an OCT? Because I have seen this happening. I have seen uh, uh, other specialities um, just ask for an OCT rather than an OCT and a visual field. How accurate? How much um, can you do? As Is it just a screening or does it really give you some information? So, yeah, when you mentioned about other specialty, uh, uh, let me put it in this way. A retina specialist can't work without an OCT. But as a yes. glaucoma specialist, we can work without an OCT. OCT is not a must. No. OCT is a added advantage in an armamentarium, glaucoma armamentarium wherein it will give some advantage, but you can't be solely dependent on the OCT for your diagnosis. So if somebody is a comprehensive ophthalmologist who is practicing glaucoma based on NCT or an OCT because everybody has an OCT machine now, they yes. would have an OCT but not a perimetry because yes. they calculate in terms of break of them of what investment they have invested. Mm -hmm. so OCT is a very important resource for a retina practice, but for a glaucoma practice, we can't be totally dependent only on OCT. We need to need to use a clinical acumen to visualize the field, uh, visualize the optic disc properly first to yes. see whether there is, as Dr. Chandra might pointed out, any glaucomatous disc is if the suspicion is there. Look for it. Look for the IOP again. COVID is there in my health practice also hospital. What we do is we use an eye care tonometer as a screening tonometer for all. Mm -hmm. But if at all if the pressure falls above 20, then we subject them to apprehension tonometer. Mm -hmm. So I've seen a lot of people treating glaucoma based on NCT, based on OCT. It is not advocated. Always yes. please do an apprehension tonometer if the pressure is outside the normal range. Yes. Do a gonioscopy. Gonioscopy is a must. At least if you don't have a gonioscope, try to do a von Herrick's, then subject the patient to visual fields. If you don't have a visual field machine, there are always common centers where a perimetry can be done. So get mm -hmm. a perimetry from that particular area. And if you have an OCT, a fancy tool, correlate all these things and then come to a diagnosis. Yes. Without fields, without proper examination, just by seeing an OCT report, okay, RNFL, it is red, average RNFL is red color. That means patient is branded glaucoma. I don't agree and I don't recommend to do this at all in anybody uh, in anybody's practice. Dr. Suganya, can I say a word about correlation? Yeah. Mm -hmm. You see, it is always taught that correlation is important. So what people do is they 
do a disc examination maybe with disc photography and correlated with oct and if the two are found abnormal and yeah suspected they start treatment so this is actually very very unfortunate because mm -hmm. oct represents only disc so it is not separate from disc examination so it should be taken as an extended part of optic disc examination mm -hmm. rather than another corroborative evidence it's not corroborative uh, to the disc examination yes um, now Actually, people are... add on this oct point is that oct has a lot of red and green disease the database is limited it's not on our patients and many patients who have absolutely no glaucoma their octs look very glaucomatous because because of the myopia and there's so many other fungus factors people don't look at that and they just start treating so structure and function both must be done together and correlate only <laughs> then it's a glaucoma otherwise and that too should progress it's not one time that is structure function correlates they just pop maybe a scar in the corioretinal thing that will <laughs> that will also correlate so therefore structure function must correlate as well as the oct is absolutely assistance it's not in the cardinal or it's not in the hallmark no actually what i have noticed is because of this ganglion cell complex uh, the software in the oct machine the company people have started marketing to everybody sir gcc is there if it is read in gcc early diagnosis of glaucoma so you are trying to diagnose at a very early stage so every every oct every doctor who is having an oct machine gets a gcc done if it is read in color forget no fields forget optic disc evaluation just start an anti glaucoma medication that yeah. is the practice which is being followed and i please advocate don't start this practice use a comprehensive glaucoma examination and then continue in fact we don't need to diagnose glaucoma very very early this is a misconception created by industry that we need to diagnose glaucoma very early we don't need mm -hmm. because it is a functional deterioration which is significant in the life of a patient and yeah. not simply a structural finding i'm not yeah. talking of structural disease but a structural finding and mm -hmm. structural disease cannot be diagnosed unless you demonstrate progression so if you are doing anything based only on structure whether it is disc or oct or fundus photograph it has to show progression yes uh, dr madhu since you're here i would like to ask you about ace oct because um, i'm also seeing a lot of uh, ophthalmologists using that to replace um, gonioscopy in fact um, when the pandemic was at its height i was also actually not doing a gonioscopy as much as i should have because of the fear factor what is your opinion on the anterior segment oct for assessing the angle first and foremost there is really nothing that can replace gonioscopy because see mm -hmm. oct as oct what you will get what are the factors which i would say are against it first and foremost is the cost you adding an investigation of cost which is not even giving you enough value of what you are getting clinically mm -hmm. you can see you can see the angle you can document the width but other than width you cannot document anything else mm -hmm. you can really not doc you can't indent it mm -hmm. you cannot see the blotchy pigments on the trabecular meshwork which you will be able to see otherwise in a patient who is having some acute attacks you cannot see pass you, there's so many other things which you will not be really able to see and we are a country of angle rosa glaucoma though the the yes. studies are done in south and mm -hmm. they're saying 50 50 but truly speaking where i'm sitting i'm seeing at least 60 70 per percent people are actually angle closure so in angle closure glaucoma this can only give you a research paper mm -hmm. but for managing glaucoma every day it's it's not really an ideal tool yes but for a when, non when you need... person can he use a non glaucoma person if he has an oct and, and some some of these models have an anterior segment uh, part of it can they use it as a screening and then they uh, as is what do you think about that no i don't think it's really so uh, useful as a screening tool unless until we have a 360 degree we don't have a 360 degree we're taking only one cut section so one cut section is not enough whereas in a gonioscopy you can do see 360 degree all all around along with its mobility which is far more important than uh, just that screening tool for screening i'm sure the devices will come because believe me they are required for screening but there will have to be a 360 degree slice device which gives you the, at least 2d's 2d's means that they give you the the thing like that how much is the angle open and what's happening 360 degrees Yes. So that day is not far. It's, it's, it's not far. It's come. I think the machine has already That's come. That's what I'm saying. Can I add? 
Yeah, I just yeah, like yeah. to add to that as far as anterior uh, OCT is concerned, I don't think it's a useful instrument at all in uh, glaucoma for us. In fact, if you compare that, we need the UBM more often because when you do a YAG PI and then you discover that your patient has a plateau iris, the anterior yes. OCT is not going to help. The UBM is going to help yeah. diagnose it. Anything so ciliary body, malignant glaucoma, yes. in that UBM is yes. a far more. Because you can see in the UBM, all of oh, them you can see. Yeah, yeah it is only much one better. thing where is useful. Yeah. Uh, for the perception, uh, the, the perception, thing is, I'll tell you one one disease interface in the refractive patients, hmm? in the refractive interface patients. fluids in Rome. Mm -hmm. Yes, that you can yes. see actually on OCT because the DLK and IFS both yes. look same and the treatments are opposite. So, uh, no, it's saying time up, but yeah. Holly, yeah. Yeah. but we, we still have, have four have minutes. Five I more minutes. We have four we have more minutes. Four more minutes yeah. to go. So for yeah. IFS, ASOCT is a must because the treatments are absolutely opposite. IFS will respond to glaucoma to the IOP reduction, whereas DLK will require his steroids. So that is one. If I have to, somebody ask me, I'll say it's an absolute indication. Other than that, <laughs> that's for the cornea people to do it. Um, so what is happening is nowadays most of these NCTs are coming with the image of the angle also. So okay. as OCT is bought by comprehensive ophthalmologist or a cataract surgeon. All these NCT, which is bought for a screening purpose, they show the section of the angle also. So the day is not far, I think, when people will start looking at this section and start doing PI also. So we yeah. have to give this a very strong message that mm -hmm. this section of the angle, which you see on your normal NCT machine, yes. both, the, both the values what you're getting on the NCT, the IOP and the cut section of the angle is just for screening and not for treating. But it's very difficult to get that message across. We have to... Do so, uh, do more. We got to simplify the procedures. Like truly, I'm telling you for gonoscopy, there's no need to remember any classification. Just remember four structures and one, two, three, four, one structure, one, two, two structure, two, three structure, three, four structure, four. And let's put a virus curve and you're done. Ophthalmologists who are doing complicated phaco surgeries, complicated retinal surgeries, or cornea surgery, they will not put in a gonioscope. I mean, they, there's such a mental barrier towards that. I mean it just truly can be done. It's such a simple procedure, but um, it's not only India. And I leave. Thank you very much because I have another session. Yes, yeah. I think uh, we'll be winding nice up. You all. Thank you so much, Dr. Paul. Thank, thank you so much, Dr. Manadeep Singh, Dr. Tayan, Dr. Madhu, and Dr. Amit. Thank you so much for uh, taking part in the IC. And um, thank you to the uh, hall mod, uh, coordinator also. Thank you so much. It, it was a wonderful, wonderful IC, session. I suppose, very well planned. And Dr. Madhu's talk was, you know, really, really very eye opener. A uh, lot of it's information here. we got even at this uh, stage. And uh, ma'am, I would uh, love to have this this talk of yours, uh, you know, listening to this over a half an hour session. Right. It, was, it is eight half minutes, an hour. 10 minute session. It, it, it is half, it is half In an fact, hour. In fact, all the speakers provided beautiful slides and such authoritative statements. I'm very, very uh, impressed. And I really do thank you all for taking part in the IC. Thank you thank so you much. Thank you, Sukanya, for calling us over.